And the great thing about God's Word, when we get through dealing with it, you go right back and deal with it some more. This is the only book that's alive. It's the only book that's actually a person. Uh, the Word was made flesh. Now, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't believe in the Bible. And just like this morning, I pray and I hope with all of my heart that folk listen to what thus saith the Word of the Lord. Now, sometimes preaching, when God's people are affirming His Word, and hearing his word and accepting his word, it's a good feeling to be preaching his word. Does that make sense to you? On the other hand, when there's folk that resist the word, well, when there's folk that don't want to hear the word, that's a different kind of preaching. It's like driving a nail through a knot that's in a board. I don't reckon nobody hearing that. Now the nail will go. But you might have to hit it a little harder than normal. God's word is God's word. But I'm not going to say we're going to get through this verse, but we're going to try well, we'll see how it goes with us. Uh, in John, the 14th chapter, the 6th verse, uh, that's the one verse that is the Bible in a verse. It's everything you need to know in a verse. But then again, one word of God's word is enough we need. I read about a fella in the prison few weeks ago, don't know when it had happened, and I don't even know if it was over here, but smoking his stuff in prison, couldn't get a hold of cigarette paper to roll it up, but he did have a Bible. You know, them pages is thin most of the time, and tore a chunk out of God's Word, and Rolled up his doby or whatever it was he was a smoking. Well, as he got ready to light it, <laughs> read just a, a couple of words. Amen. Yes, Lord. Why persecutest thou me? Decided he'd find out what that was. Got to dig it into God's word a little bit. Come to find out there was a man out there uh, whose name was Jesus. Come to find out he left his home in glory. Went to a hill called Calvary. Shed his precious blood. Made a way that you and I might be born again and spared from the pit of hell. Amen. Got saved right there in his jail cell. Amen. That's God's word. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth and the life. Double dot colon. Now just pause there a second. Say, take that in. No man, no man cometh unto the Father, the Father, The Father, but by me. Now let's not go too fast and back up to that beginning again in case we 
uh, leave some stuff out. Uh, uh, that precious name, Jesus. The verse starts out with the name Jesus. Well, that right there would cause a problem in this country already. Uh, you see, we're living in a day and time where everybody, it seems, don't have a problem with nobody's name, but the name, I'm going to check where I'm at. Uh, if your name is Islam, that's all right. If your name is Buddha, that's all right. If, you, if your name is Carl Snake or whatever it is, that's all right. But when you begin to mention the name Jesus, uh, you begin to talk about the son of the living God, all of a sudden it begins to run folk the wrong way. Uh, I saw a little clip the other day of uh, some get together they had in a town. The big wheels was there. The sheriffs and the judges and the folk that had pretty license plates on their car. You know what I'm talking about. And they all got in the state owned building. Sat behind them pretty wood desks. And following procedure, Whew. somebody said, uh, we need somebody to say a prayer. Kick us off. And everybody was fumbling with their papers and they weren't paying no attention. And they called on some old fella out yonder. Old ragged looking. He didn't have them pretty clothes on. He just... Look like he might have just left work or something, but they called on him anyhow. Well, he, uh, he must have got somebody's attention. Because all them folk that was fumbling with the papers and diddle doodling with their, their pencils, and all of a sudden, uh, this man began to call out the name Jesus. Well, when he began to pray in the name of Jesus, you saw every head of that wood desk pop up. Their eyes got real big, and that lady in charge grabbed the gravel, and she began to beat that table and said, Order, 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 order. Hey, you can't do that in here. And that man hushed up and looked at her, and she went on to explain that thing. Uh, 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 you can pray, but you just can't be using that name. Now, we're going to have to leave that name Jesus out. Well, church, I want to tell you, the only name that will put order back in America is the name of Jesus Christ. The only name that is going to give us hope and give us joy. The only name that will fix your home, fix your heart, fix your job, fix your life, and fix America is the name of Jesus Christ. And shame on that country that is supposed to be built on the Word of God that has a problem with a man of God praying in the name of Jesus Christ in the courthouse. If there's one thing we need back in the court, in the White House, in your house, in my house, and in the church house is the name Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shame on somebody to slam a, gra a gavel and say that's out of order. I want to tell you it's out of order to pray in any other name but Jesus Christ. Who are you going to pray to? I challenge you to pick any other name you want to pick. Pray to that name. Pick any God you want to pick. In fact, I checked on the Google. And apparently in America, there's at least 21 gods on the loose in America right now. In fact, they got uh, one who said he's Jesus. And somehow another Mary Magdalene showed up with him. And they're going on talk show after talk show in different places. Him telling how on his first go around. That thing didn't go too well for him, and they 
caught up to him and him and Mary was having trouble with their love affair and this, that, and the other. Uh, but he's back again for his second round and he's touring a sidewalk near you. Well, let me tell you something, Chuck. I read about a man named Jesus uh, and he did come to this earth. Uh, but I promise you one thing. Uh, he weren't born in Hollywood. He weren't born in D.C. In fact, he weren't ever born. Uh, he's always been. Uh, he ain't got a birthday. He ain't got a beginning. He ain't got an end. He's the past. He's the last and he left his home in glory and he went to a hill called Calvary and he shed his blood and he died on that Roman May tree and he left but the next time he comes back he will not be walking the sidewalks and wipe them. somebody needs to get their Bible out he won't be going on Oprah doing interviews He won't be holding get-togethers where foolish people clap. Where foolish anchor folk ask them foolish questions. The next time he comes, I didn't say the next time he appears. The next time he appears, he ain't going to hang around long. I wish somebody hit me preaching here. Uh, the next time he appears, it ain't going to take long. Uh, he's just going to step out long enough uh, for old Gable to cut a tune. Woo, uh, and for long enough for him to give a shout. Woo, uh, and when he does, ah! Uh, oh! them saints. Uh, lay it over yonder, lay it over yonder, lay it over. They're going to pop up out the grave. Uh, they're going to get up on. If you got a family member that has left this world, I got news for you. There is coming a day. Uh, they're going to come up out of that grave and in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you and I are going to go up yonder. We're going to meet them in the air and it's over that fast. But the second time he actually comes, he's going to get all his hot stallions out. I don't know where he keeps them at, Lord have mercy. Folk ask me sometimes stuff I don't know. Preacher, are the animals in heaven? I ain't been there. I can't tell you what's up there. Well, you got an opinion, yeah, but it ain't no good. Uh, I don't want to talk about my opinion. Uh, I can't tell you if Bobo's up yonder or Snickles or Kittles or whatever. But what I can tell you, there's some horses. But these ain't normal. Uh, hello, somebody. Uh, these ain't normal around the mill horses. Uh, these horses is different. Uh, uh, in fact, one day uh, they just gonna line up, uh, and then out is gonna walk one uh, uh, with a vesture dipped in blood uh, and a name written on his tie and a crown upon his head uh, and another name written that no man know but he himself. And he's gonna climb on the back of that stallion, and that bayonet's gonna bow his leg before the king. Uh, and when he stands up uh, with the king of kings and the lord of lords, he's gonna look back at his children. He's going to look back at his church and say, follow me and lay in the cloud coming from glory will be our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not to be spit on, but the slaughter coming out of his mouth will not be a lollipop, but it'll be a double-edged sword. The word of the Lord. Yeah, but preacher, grandma can't ride a horse. Now mine couldn't. Neither one of them before they left here. One of them was feeble. And all she could do was lay in the bed. In fact, the only time I'd ever see her get a little bit of life in her was when I'd go pray with her. And then she'd drift back off and then left this world. Well, I know my other grandma couldn't ride one. They eventually took both her legs off. Me and Daddy had to carry her around in the bed sheet where she went. Ain't no way either one of them 
good cloud on the back of a horse. Am I preaching to anybody? Preacher, this is fairy tale stuff. Not if you read the Bible. I'm just trying to preach about the first word in this verse. Jesus said, I want you to understand who it was saying this. I don't want you to think that it's somebody that ain't got no power. I want you to know who Jesus is. Neither one of them could climb on a horse, much less ride. When they left here. But. Where are we going? There's a brand new body. <sighs> Waiting on you. A uh, different. You won't ever stump your toe uh, with somebody. <sighs> Boy, I tell you the other night. <sighs> I got up in the wee eyes in the morning. One eye opened. I don't know if the other one was or not. But I know that jury box is there. I know it is. I know it. I clear I can picture it right now. But for some reason, I like to drive my toe right into it. Just on the case, I'll just drive it in. Whoa. Hey, let me tell you, this might not be a big deal to y'all, but I want to tell you something. When I get up yonder and I get that brand new body, hey, I ain't going to stump my toe on nothing. I'm not going to have a hiccup. I'm not going to have a heartburn, a backache, a headache. You won't ever see another sweat drop on my forehead. I tell you what, I'm going to have a brand new body that is like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you can believe this or not believe this. I don't care how bad a shape your loved one was when they left this world. Every child of God when we get together with the Lord, we're coming back on the back of them horses with a brand new body. Not to fight, but to give him glory and to give him honor because we are coming back with Jesus. Amen. Buddha ain't coming. He dead and gone. Muhammad ain't making that trip. He's dead and gone. And I appreciate folk caring for me and rubbing me on my shoulder and looking around and saying, Preacher, I care for you. Please be careful. You keep mentioning other gods, the Buddhas, and the Song and Moons, and the, we just want you to be careful, cause if the wrong folk hear it, they, they might get your address or, or find out where you preach. Now, church, I'm not foolish. God gave me enough sense to look around the dark corner before I step out. But I want to tell you something. The devil's already got my address. I, hello, somebody. He knows right where I live. He knows where I work. He knows every vehicle I drive. He knows my family name, my wife's name, my children's name. He knows, he knows more about me than I know about myself. He has my address in his GPS. In fact, he comes by the house every once in a while. Hey, let me even come to where I go to church. But let me tell you something. I'm not worried about that rascal or what he can do. My Lord has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the devil ain't afraid of me, but I promise you, he is afraid of the Lord I serve. I can't knock him down, but the Lord I serve can run him off. I don't have the power, but the one I serve has all power, and I'm not going nowhere Amen. until God is done with me. Amen. But now if he's done tonight, y'all have to get you somebody else because I'm out of here. Amen. Huh? But till then, there's a no trespassing sign. You got the same one. 
the Lord has put a hedge. If the Lord did not put a hedge about you, you wouldn't be here. Your children wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be as healthy as you are. He would snatch you out. He would take everything you had. In fact, when he came, I throw Job. He just watched up there on that day when the angels was gathered. Just busted up in the meeting. I don't tell you something about it. Now, hello, somebody. Just busted up in there. Boy, I can see Michael and Gabriel now when those slew foot come walking by here. You know, God himself. Where you been? Well, he knew where he'd been, but well, I've been walking here and walking yonder. I ain't been doing nothing. I've just been, hello, somebody. I ain't been doing nothing. I've just been walking around, minding my business. Well, have you considered my Seven Job. Well, now that you mention it, Lord, since you brought it up, I have been by his house a few times, and I've checked his windows, I've checked the front door, I've checked his roof, but I can't put a hand on that man because you got a hedge about him. Everywhere I go, I can't go down, I can't go down. Everywhere I look, there's a blood trail around him, and I can't get to it. I want to tell you something about Jesus. Not only does he save you, but he stays with you. You don't drive by yourself. He's driving with you. Preacher, I don't know about that. Well, let me give you something to explain. And I don't care if they put it on, believe it or not, or I want to check my brain to see what's wrong with it. Wasn't that long ago coming to church. I got in a bad situation. Three lanes. One coming this way, one in the middle, and one going that way. Two vehicles coming at me. Didn't leave but one lane, and I was in it. And that vehicle pulled right in front of me. By best I could guess, a second, second and a half maybe, and we were going to meet head on about 50-something miles now. I didn't have time to go to the right. There weren't no need to go to the left. Or I'd run into the other car. Well, preacher, why you there wasn't nothing I could do. Not a thing I could do. But the first thing that ran through my mind. Uh, the only word that came to my mind. All I had time to do was look over the hood of my car. And when I saw what was right in front of me, all I had time to do was say, Jesus. When I looked in the mirror, that car that was at my front bumper, Facing me, I wish somebody help me preaching here. Was in my mirror at my back bumper going away from me. Now, they ain't but a couple things to happen. Either I hallucinated all of this and I'm in trouble in my head and I don't know what I'm talking about, or some strange event happened, or there was somebody who actually had the name Jesus that decided at that moment, on that day, that he was going to spare me from that trouble. And I want to tell you something. When Jesus decides to put his arms around you, can't nothing touch you. Can't nothing put his arm on you. Church, the devil has to have permission from the Lord before Jesus. Jesus. Acts 4.18 and they called them. 
and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Sounds like today. You can have church, but leave Jesus out of it now. You can get together, do all these things that God's have, <coughs> but let's steer away from this name Jesus. In fact, I read two articles this week from a Christian magazine. I said a Christian magazine. Tens of thousands of subscribers that listen to the blogs. I guess y'all call them blogs, but, but to the blog that folk put in there. And the two articles that I read this week these seminary teachers have decided that the death of Jesus is not really that important. And the resurrection is a huge controversy in the church. In fact, we're still trying to work out. We are still trying to work out. We are still trying to work out whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. But apparently the good news is, even if you don't believe that he did, or if you do, it really doesn't matter. The main thing is that you make an effort to have a new life and a new approach on life, then you're at one with the Lord. Whether you believe he rose or not. I would like to write them a letter before long and give them a correction on something. Uh, preacher, why are you going to correct what they said? No, I don't want it. I'm going to leave that alone. They want to believe that garbage. They know better. They read the same book I read. It ain't that hard to understand. Mary, John, Peter, all them folks, they came up to the garden that day. They walked over yonder and the stone was laying over yonder in the dirt. Sitting on top of it was an angel of the Lord. They walked over to Mary and said, Hey! Why are you in the graveyard? Why are you in the graveyard looking for the living? In other words, if you're here looking for Jesus, you're in the wrong place. There ain't nobody here but dead people. Hey, I want to tell you, it's not that hard to understand in God's Word that Jesus came, Jesus died, and Jesus rose from the dead. But here's what I want to correct them on. They say they're Christian. I say I'm a Christian. I say y'all are Christian. But that word we Christians believe. Amen. We're still trying to figure out. If he did rise from the dead, and we Christians are still having a big controversy <laughs> as to whether or not he's alive, I'd like to send them a little letter. And if I get their address, I will. I want them to understand. They need to find another pronoun than we. 
They need to ride over yonder in the column somewhere. Not everybody but us because at this church, I, I want to tell you, I can bring you to a lot of people that ain't got no worry, ain't got no doubt. They ain't confused every bit uh, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, he went to Golgotha's hill, he died, but he arose, he was alive then, he is alive now. Don't include me in your devilish teaching. Amen. Now, just in case, Roy, this makes it to California or Illinois or wherever it was from. In the case they lived in. Y'all need to fire. Them folk you got teaching seminary. Because y'all don't realize this, but you have been invaded. For the Bible says, the word says, thus saith the Lord, any that denies Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God is an antichrist. And listen to this, university. If you put a man or a woman in charge of your seminary that is teaching young preachers and pastors that Jesus Christ may or may not have died, all you have done is hired the devil to preach in your school because that did not come from the Lord. It came from the devil. When you take the death burial and resurrection out of the Bible, you have no Bible. Jesus did what them other gods have done. He died. But here's where the story is different. They were selling tickets the other day. I forget what country. I was actually out of curiosity looking for vacation spots. <laughs> Little boat rides and different things I thought would be interesting one day to... Well, I found one. Over yonder somewhere. And a whole list of used to be gods that have died. And they got their grave sites on display and it was pretty cheap I believe you could send them about $145 and you get a six hour boat ride and while that man with the long pole paddled that boat he pulled you out to this grave site tell you about this deity and this God and read his tombstone to you Paddle on down there to the next God and read his tombstone. And, and at high noon, they, they feed you. And that 145 includes a meal. And then you'll take the last trek on that boat ride. And you go by about three more grave sites. And they got pamphlets with writings on all these gods of how they died. And when they died, and where are they at? I did not tell Kelly about that trip. I didn't think there'd be any need for us to book that vacation. There ain't no way I'd be comfortable. In fact, I, we might get kicked off the boat. Hello, somebody, because I got a funny suspicion. Oh, yeah. uh, when we pulled up to that first graveyard, and there sat old carved stone with a date beginning and a date ending. 
and they say, God, so-and-so laying right here, I'd like to stand up on that old Ricky Dink boat, hold up this double-edged sword and say, yo, I got one better for you. It ain't cost me a dime. And one day I'm going to go up yonder and eat a free meal. But I know a Lord that came, he died, but you can't find his grave site no more because he ain't in there. It used to bother me that the Lord was so poor that he had to borrow a grave. But I want to tell you, it don't bother me no more because I realized he weren't going to need it that long anyhow. Just three days to lay there. The name of Jesus is offensive to folk because it offends what they believe. Now, if you believe you got 72 virgins waiting on you, and you believe this crazy mess, I can see you getting so messed up that you'll fly a plane in the building or, or blow somebody up. I can see it. But the name of Jesus, he don't promise you nothing about no virgins. But he does make some promises. He promises that if you'll hold on. And endure. If folk don't like enduring no more. Folk want that easy religion, don't they? Where nobody gets mad at you, nobody gets upset with you, and everybody pats you on the back and loves you to death. But I got news for you. If you preach the truth, tell the truth, stand on the truth, and live the truth, not everybody's going to like you. They're going to dislike you. In fact, you're going to be a problem. And Lord have mercy, folk try it all the time. Give me an earful, give me an ear, but they still don't realize all the junk you talk, all it does is make me that much more happy and make me that more glad because I don't want to be patted on the back by every. Everybody. I want to get in somebody's wheelhouse ever once in a while. If you come in here and you reject Jesus Christ and you don't care nothing about God's Word, I want you to be miserable while you're sitting in this church hearing the Word of the Lord. If you ain't hooked up to Him tight, and church don't mean that much to you, it don't bother you to miss. I want you to sit in your chair in this church. Lord have mercy. I don't like it in here. I do. Because if you'll keep sitting there and you let that Holy Ghost keep knocking on your heart. It won't be long you're going to get up out of that chair and you're going to come up to this altar. And that first step you take when you step out, you will already be right with the Lord. And then I ain't got to preach to you about coming to church. You won't to come to him. I get an amen. I ain't going to have to preach to you about reading the Bible. You're going to want to read the Bible. I ain't going to have to preach to you about those things that thus saith the Lord Jesus because you'll have a desire. That name Jesus, Acts 21, 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. What on earth would make a grown man Say, so don't cry for me. I'm ready to die just for his name. And I thought about that. What on earth could the Lord have done for Paul that would make Paul make such a statement that just for his name, I'm willing to die right now. And not only would I, but I'd count it a joy. I said, Lord, have mercy. I need to figure this out. 
What on earth did the Lord do for this man? That was, and then Doug, it come to me. Well, I remember when all the change happened with Saul. I remember when he, he went by the big man in charge by the church. And when he went by the old church house, he said, Look at here, I'd like to have some paperwork. I, I'm on the way to Damascus, and I want some paperwork. That way, when I get to Damascus, I can just arrest every man, every woman, anybody that is claiming allegiance to the name Jesus Christ. I want to arrest them and bring them back to prison. All I need is some paperwork. Give me some money and give me some men, and I'll be on my way. And I remember when old Saul was going down that Damascus road. Somebody stepped out in front of his horse. Church. Now Saul didn't know who that was. Stand the Lord have mercy. Saul didn't know who that was standing in the middle of the road. But that horse did. Hello, somebody. And when that horse saw the king of kings and the Lord of lords, they were no way he was going to keep going forward. Long story short, Saul ended up in the dirt. I don't know where the horse went. But while he was laying there in that dirt, somebody called out to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then Saul asked the only question he could ask. Well, who are you? I know who I am. I'm on the way to work for God Almighty. I'm on the way to clean up the mess that they've made with this Jesus fella. I got the courage and I've got the faith and I've got the love of God and his word. I'm on the way to Damascus and when I get to Damascus for the name of the God of glory, I'm going to clean up what this man named Jesus has made a mess of. Now, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutest. Let me give this story to you in a nutshell. It's hard to kick against the pricks. Let me summarize this story for you in layman terms. There was a bulldog named Saul. And I don't mean that in a bad way. That man was on fire for God Almighty. He had backbone, he had courage, and he was not afraid. He was heading to Damascus, and anybody that claimed the name Jesus, spoke the name Jesus, even mentioned the name. If he knew you was thinking about the name of Jesus, he had the paperwork to lock you. He didn't care who you was, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, somebody big, somebody little. He meant to do business, and when he went down that road, with a pocket full of money and a band of men behind him. The Lord, the one that he was going to put down met him on the highway. And when he met him on the road, he said, you know what, Saul? It's hard for you to kick a... You know what a prick is? When you have an old stubborn hog or you had an old stubborn bull or a stubborn cow, whatever livestock you had, that would not go 
where he was supposed to go. Boy, Grandpa put me out there with them hogs. Them things hard-headed if they don't want to move. You can pull them by the ear, kick them, spray them with the water, hose, do whatever you but if he don't want to move. But if you get one of them old sharp sticks, you walk around to the backside. You poke him with the sharp end. Y'all ain't hearing me right. I said the sharp end. I said the sharp end of the stick. I don't care how big and bad that hog is. He can be an 1,800-pound bull. But if you juke him hard enough with that sharp stick, he'll find a gear going in the direction that you want him to find. Now, God knew that Paul was a bulldog. He knew that Paul had power and strength and faith and courage. But what Paul didn't know, that he was getting ready to get his name from Saul to Paul. But when the Lord introduced himself, the Lord forgave him of his sin. He put him on the right path. He blinded his eyes. But for the first time in Saul's life, he could see clearly. And God gave that man a joy that he had never felt before and gave him a life that till the day he died he felt he did not deserve. Because up to the day old Paul died he said I am the worst of all because I persecuted the name of Jesus. And I shouldn't even have my right to nothing. But he forgave me. Church, you want to know what the sharp end of this word is? Well, I tell you what, we could probably grow to a number out here where we'd have to knock these walls down and move to the gym back yonder and make the saints work. It wouldn't be that hard to do. Boy, the devil would get with us. I mean, hell, y'all didn't know you was good at building churches, did you? Hell, I wish somebody helped me. I wish somebody helped me preach around. I, preacher, you lost your mind. No, I, I don't you know how good the devil is at building churches? They everywhere. He'll build them up to 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. All that you want to come in, the only thing you got to do is leave Jesus out of it. But the sharp end of this Bible is the name Jesus Christ. Because it'll look inside of you. And them things that are not pleasing to the Lord, it'll pull them off of you. If Brother Linwood drives a nail this week, and misses it with the hammer. Oh, yeah. And something comes out. Oh, yeah. If Macy driving around this week, if she's in a bad hurry, I ain't ever even trying to make nobody mad. Y'all said I could use you. If old Terry Running late for work. Somebody just pull right in front of them. Drop it down to 10 mile now. Goes 10 feet and then give the signal. And old Terry let something. If anybody in this church this week does anything whether it's a word, an action, a deed, a thought, whatever it is, if you do anything this week that goes against the word of God, 
and is displeasing to the Lord, the Holy Ghost is going to convict you. Amen. And if you don't listen, He's going to beat the fire out of you. When I was growing up, I had one job. You know what it was? Listen. Listen. No matter what was said, listen. If it was said, sit down. Listen and sit down. Now, it didn't matter who said it. If grandma said it, if daddy said it, if my aunt said it, if the uncle said it, if a grown up I didn't know said it, if the teacher said it, if the co it don't matter who said it. You did it. The consequent was that if you did not listen, there was a price to pay. God's word does not ask your opinion. It does not ask you how you feel about it. It does not ask you for your advice. It tells you how to live, how to breathe, how to walk, how to behave, how do you carry yourself, what to do, what not to do. God's word is a commandment book. And if you follow it, you're blessed. But if you break it, you will deal with the Holy Ghost. The Bible is talking to us. The reason this book is sharp, it hits you and I in our soft spots. Did you know the Lord and the devil knows where you're weak at? Some of you is tough as nails in some areas. The devil's wasting his time to bother you with some stuff. But there's some other areas. Oh, you mighty fragile. You're not as strong at that's where he's coming, church. Some of you are like pieces of rock when it comes to some things. There's some things you wouldn't touch, you wouldn't do, you wouldn't because they're all saying you wouldn't be caught dead around it. You'll never bend or waver at all. But there's other areas in your life. It don't take much to get you out of whack. Hello, somebody. It don't take much to get you discombobulated. The, the devil's coming there. But that's the area that the Lord wants to help you on. Oh. The Bible is wrote to you and I. As it's coming, I want to tie this up, but I want you to listen. John 10, 9. I am the door. You, you see that John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way. The way to what? But he did not say a way. He said, the way. And I watched that interview where it was three, I believe it was, of the most famous preachers in America right now. And between the three of them, millions upon millions of followers. Between the three of them, right at 60 to 75,000 church members. On national television, point blank ask the question, is Jesus Christ the only way a person can be saved? Three answers from three different preachers and not one. Not one looked in that camera and said, I am telling you with all authority of God's word. Jesus Christ is the only way to 
to heaven. For John 10, 9 says that I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Ephesians 2, 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth. Folk, many places do not want to hear the truth anymore. Folk come to me all the time. Why do you preach at your church? We looking for somewhere to go. But we don't want to be in one of them. You know, you can't do nothing, churches. We like having fun. We, we don't want to go to one of them places. Oh, slobber preacher up yonder. Spitting and yelling. Reminding us all the time about a hell. Well, you might want to bypass coming out here. Because I'm going to tell you something. Not only am I going to warn you about hell, but I'm going to look at the Sunday night crowd. I'm going to look at the Wednesday night crowd. I'm going to look at the Sunday morning crowd and tell even the Christians if you get outside of the word of the Lord and reject him as Savior you will go to hell. You will be there forever and you will burn, burn, burn and never get out except that day that he pulls you out of hell makes you stand in front of him long enough you are the Christ and I don't mind telling my church folk if you end up there He's going to reach down, pick you up, and the Bible says cast into the lake of fire. You ain't good enough. Jesus Christ never, ever needed you for anything. Can I get an amen in this church? When you walk through the doors of this church, there's not one individual, including me, that has the right to walk through that oval door with your chest poked out, saying now we can have church because I'm here, but how we should walk through that door, Lord have mercy, is with a spirit of thanksgiving in our heart and a praise of glory unto our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because I know I was not worthy. I I know I was unfit. I know I should be burning in the flames of hell tonight. But by the grace of the living God of glory, he sent his son whose name is Jesus Christ. And he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He was the way, he is the way, and he will always... Be the way. And any other message is a lie of hell from the devil. <laughs> and I want to close right here. We ain't going to finish this verse. But at least that first word was is a good one. Jesus. When John the Baptist was about to get his head cut off, they weren't but one thing he wanted to know.
Well, y'all go find out. Is that Jesus? Boy, Jesus sent a message back to John. You tell John. The blind are receiving their sight. The deaf are hearing the lepers are being cleaned. The lame is good. But you tell John. The gospel is being preached. When Mary Magdalene, back when she was... She weren't supposed to be there. Them men was having a meeting inside. A woman was not supposed to bust up in a man's meeting here. Hello, somebody. But while Jesus was standing down, and I'm closing right here, a lady who had a reputation came up down on the ground up to his feet and when she got to his feet she took tears and she began to wash them feet and didn't say a word and while she was washing them feet She'd take a big old lock of her hair and dry them feet off. But I could picture old Mary have to keep drying them. Because I don't think she could stop crying. And boy, why she was washing them feet. One of them men standing over yonder, he had a thought run through his mind. If that man knew what kind of woman that was, he would not be standing there letting her put her hands on his feet. But what that man didn't realize, it was people like her and people like me and people like you is the reason that he came and the reason that he died. The reason that Jesus Christ came to this earth was no matter how dirty, no matter how vile, or no matter how far off you was. That when you called out to his name, he would forgive you of your sins. That is the message of Jesus Christ. And that is the message to be preached in the church. And I ask you to stand tonight. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man. Now church, we didn't get past the first word. But what a first word it is. And I pray tonight if he's spoken to your heart, I invite you to come. Lord bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus.